Ask the Expert, where we bring you the top experts on dog health, training, grooming, and more. You ask it and we'll answer it. I'm Marissa Sarbach. Thank you for joining us today. A healthy gut is vital to the well-being of humans and animals. And apart from tummy rubs, there is plenty you can do for your dog's belly. Today we have Chief Veterinary Officer Dr. Jerry Klein on the show to teach us all about proper gut health. Now, if this is your first time watching the show, sending us your questions is very simple. Just go to facebook.com slash American Kennel Club and comment your question below on this video. Dr. Klein, great to have you with us in studio today. My pleasure. And happy National Purebred Dog Day. Purebred, <laughs> my, your, your I know, all well. of them. All, all of them, them, yes. So today we are talking about gut health and I wanna talk about first what goes into the gut because there are so many microorganisms that play a role, some that are good, some that are bad that live in that gut. Well, we've all heard we are what we eat mm -hmm. and that's very true and, and dogs and cats are as well and other animals. And we know that the uh, gut is filled of microbiomes of bacteria and viruses and even fungi and yeast that have a certain balance. And as long as there's a certain balance and that balance check is in check, then our health is good. My first lecture in vet school talked about something called homeostasis, when everything is in balance. When things are not in balance, something is off. And we now know that our immunity relies very much on our gut microbiome. And we do want to bring up some more information on the screen so everybody can read along with us too. So this just kind of demonstrates how it affects all of your dog. I mean, would you say it affects their health, happiness? What is it that really plays a role here? Well, obviously it can affect their digestive health. Uh, dogs that have improper uh, fecal quality, either poor, pudding-like stool, especially if it's mixed with constipation, those would be dogs to be considered if they're fedding an inappropriate diet. We have to rule out that there's any medical basis for it. If a dog has hookworms or whoopworms, of course their stools are not gonna be good. But if you've had your dog checked out already and they have a history of having certain issues or they're being treated with medicines to treat certain conditions, then maybe the gut flora may be out of balance. So fecal quality is really going to be the first maybe sign that you notice with your dog if and, there's an issue. And also dogs that are very flatulent. And we all know certain dogs that can clear a room out and certain breeds <laughs> are notorious for that. And some of it is just breed specific. But there may be a real reason for that microbiome being off causing excess flatulence or not digesting the food properly. And I do want to bring up some more information on screen now just to see a few of those symptoms. So if anybody is noticing something with their dog, they can follow along with us. Obesity, skin conditions, those are going to be a few that you can notice right in your own home with your dog. Well, again, as long as there's no other medical reasons like hypothyroid or something else, we have to uh, be considerate of the fact that microbiome may be off on those dogs. And we certainly know that dogs that are obese have a different microbiome balance than dogs that are in proper weight. And it extends to even dogs that may have chronic allergies or severe periodontal disease, uh, ear and eye infections. Uh, there may be other causes as well. So there is we're just doing the studies right now. They're doing them also in humans. And it's very interesting. What we learned could really affect how our dogs and we will eat. And what about when we talk about causes of any of these gut issues? I mean, are they natural causes or can some of them be inflicted by humans? I think if a dog is thriving and doing well, probably everything is in checks and balance. Uh, dogs that are fed inappropriate foods, uh, possibly higher in carbohydrates and lower in proteins or other diets, they may have an imbalance in that, in that uh, balance. Let's take a look at some of those causes on screen as well, just so everyone can read along with us. So some of the things when we talk about people bringing in those issues or maybe inflicting that issue on their dog's gut, are we talking about prescribed medications? Is that something you could give your dog that causes this? If there's a medical pathogen or a problem that needs to be treated, you certainly have to use certain agents, whether it's uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories or even antibiotics. But the result of that is that that can interrupt the natural bacterial flora. So in those cases, the use of another ingredient like a probiotic might be indicated. If a dog is thriving, they probably is doing just fine and the balance is intact. Can allergies play a role into this? Can they affect your gut? We're starting to notice that allergies uh, and yeast and everything else may be a result of an imbalance in the gut microbiome. So there might be this kind of like link between all of this. And I think it's uh, when we talk about holistic health, we're looking at everything, what we eat and how our immune system is responding or over responding. And so this really plays into whether we're talking about humans or dogs, really affects everyone. Very much. It's an interesting study. It certainly tells us what we know now is different than what we suspected maybe 30 years ago. And what we may know about this 10 years from now may really affect how and what we eat. 
Great, now we're gonna take our first question. Margaret says, my four month old Aussie puppy has Giardia. Is that an unhealthy gut or is that just a puppy thing? Well, Giardia is a pathogen, is a protozoal parasite that will cause diarrhea. That being said, it's gonna be treated by using antibiotics. Giving it probiotics will not get rid of the Giardia, but you have to give it medication to kill the Giardia. But once you do and you've given it antibiotics, it might be a good idea to ask your veterinarian to maybe start on a small uh, requisite of uh, probiotic to get its gut back in its natural bacterial flora. So again, if you have an underlying pathogen like parasites or something else, you have to treat that first. But when you're treating it, you may Im uh, cause an imbalance in the proper microbiome. And going off Margaret's question, I mean, is this something a lot of puppy owners are going to see or maybe something we'll see in older dogs or does age not really play anything into it? Age can. Let's, let's I'll talk about a, a dog that maybe had parvovirus. A parvovirus can kill it. And you certainly don't want to uh, supplement them with a... Uh, uh, extra bacteria in the gut if they're already in the what we call the leukopenic or the immunosuppressed phase. But once they start to recover, they may need a little boost and to get their gut back in this natural bacterial flora. So it can affect every age and certainly as dogs get older, they may manifest themselves with different problems and uh, teeth disease and arthritis. So it's not uh, strictly a young dog or old dog thing. It, it's an individual thing. In terms of Giardia, what would you be looking for as a symptom from that? Well, Giardia usually is loose stool, sometimes with blood. And it's very common in younger dogs, although in the city where I live in Chicago, we tend to see it uh, in many places. A giardia is common uh, wherever there's puddles of water. So we have to make sure that when we're talking about these problems, there's not an underlying medical problem. So a, a fecal sample is certainly first thing on the agenda. If you've ruled everything else out and you're still having issues, that's the time to talk to your veterinarian about maybe considering adding something to the diet to maybe uh, finding a balance. Our next question is in. Roxy says, I have a five-month-old Brittany that has very soft stools, not diarrhea. What could she be looking at as an issue there? Again, first things first, talk to your veterinarian, find out the diet, and find out if your dog has any parasites. A fecal exam is a requisite on that. If everything else is okay, find out the type of food you're feeding. I'm always amazed when, you ask, when I ask a client, what are you feeding your dog? And we'll mention the brand, but I'll say, what kind of protein is it? And they have no idea. Read the label. Read, you know, is it a chicken-based protein? Is it, is it a lamb? Uh, what are the ingredients in it? And then that may be something to consider. Uh, if the dog isn't thriving on that and everything else is clear, then you may want to ask your veterinarian about starting a probiotic or asking about a fecal culture to see if there's any kind of problems in that. And, and just speaking of diet there, I do want to bring up some more information on screen to talk about the different foods that can cause a leaky gut. So we do want to focus on having a higher protein and a lower carbohydrate. Is that the correct mix? Well, we know that oh, obese dogs, their, their gut microbiome is going to be different than a dog that's in good health. And they respond best to changes in diets that are lower in carbs. So dogs that are fed higher carbs with snacks and everything else will become obese and that in turn will change their microbiome and that can certainly cause obese maybe a, a factor in obesity whether it's a cause and effect we don't know yet but they're doing also studies in dogs that bloat you know like a great dane uh, do they bloat because their microbiome is off or do they is their microbiome off and then they bloat you know the chicken and the egg question mm -hmm. but i think there's a lot of interesting studies done on various problems medical problems that may have relation to the gut microbiome and we talk about food for our dogs is it important to find something that's organic and natural or does it not really make too much of a difference i'm always very wary of the word natural because we have to realize that nature can be very evil in its own device <laughs> i mean they have uh, natural poisonous mushrooms so just because because it's natural does not mean it's good. I think it should be uh, well balanced uh, and in its proper protein and you should ask your veterinarian and read a label. Uh, read the expiration date, read the label, the shelf life. Find out what works best for your dog. What works best for your dog may be different than my dog. If it works well, stick to it. Uh, do your research. Uh, sometimes the, what you think may be best may not be the best. So uh, some of the more exotic foods uh, they were touted as being better, but I think what we've done and learned in research, uh, there's some questions to be, to be answered still. So I think find the food that your, the breeder recommends, 
the veterinarian recommends, and that your dog thrives on. And if it's doing well, chances are you're doing okay. And don't touch it. If they're doing well, don't leave it alone. Don't touch it. Yeah, very much so. All right, we're going to take our next question. Cindy says, is it necessary to have a set feeding time or is it okay to let them graze? My dog has never been one to gobble his food and has been doing very well on the grazing method. Well, I have two new puppies <laughs> and I'm going to be guilty of the fact that I put food out for both of them. But I used to say, put it out at a certain time, and leave it out for 15 or 20 minutes. And the reason that's good is that it develops better eating habits. Also, you can tell if a dog is off their feed by if they're not eating very well. And you can monitor and proportion their food as they need. Uh, some dogs eat to live and other ones live to eat. Uh, the dogs that I have right now remind me of their grandparents. The male will wait until she finishes mm -hmm. eating, and he's such a kind dog. Aww. And when she's finished, he'll walk on over and then <laughs> take his time and eat. So he's a extra. real gentleman, and I don't have the heart to, to separate them, Aww. but eventually I probably will. Uh, but ideally, I would tell a client, if they have one dog, to put food out, leave it out for 15 or 20 minutes, and then take it away, and then do separate feedings that way. How important is it to stick to that time schedule? If you feed at 3 o'clock, always feed at 3 o'clock. Well, I think dogs are based on consistency. They thrive on consistency. They want to go out at a certain time. And their stool and urine habits are related to when they eat. And I think that mimics when they were nursing with the mother. Uh, they nurse and the mother licks them and then they defecate and urinate. So if they feed and eat at a certain time, they're probably gonna wanna defecate and urinate. So it'll help your house breaking tremendously if you stick to a schedule. Schedules with them really incorporate everything and help everything. It's like a baby, but you really have to develop the schedules you want later in life, early in life as well. Great. Our next question is in from Sandy. She says, I buy deli chicken from Costco and put a little bit chopped up on my dog's kibble. Usually no more than maybe a quarter of a cup. Is that okay? I've heard it's not good for them. My dog is a 110 pound German Shepherd, eats both in the morning and at night about two thirds of a cup per meal. Well, the concern with nitrates, uh, with, with cold cuts is nitrates, is high salt content and everything else. But I will fess up. I get a rotisserie chicken <laughs> once a day or every other day, and I do shredded white meat added to my dog's food Probably as well. Probably a treat. It is. I feel better about it, yeah. and I think <laughs> they do, and they eat really well. Uh, I, and they, I mix it with their food. It's the same protein they're being fed. So I'm not going to chastise this person as long as she realizes that cold cuts are a little bit different, just like if we eat cold cuts. It's higher in, in salts and nitrates. It has some chemicals in it. So if she has the option to buy I got a wonderful rotisserie organic chicken and shred up the chicken breast. Might be breast. a little bit better. I would feel better about her. Maybe her pocketbook might not be, but I mean, I think that, it, that the premise is the same, but you're doing a little bit better job of it. And I think that just goes to show when we talk about how many dogs have different type of gut, because my dog would not do well with that. She, well, she has a very gut issue. She really does. And some dogs can't handle chicken, and that's exactly the point. Every dog is an individual, and it's difficult to give out uniform information for my dog that will apply to your dog or to her dog. But you find out what works best and what they thrive on, and you try to stick to that. And ask around, ask the breeder, ask the veterinarian, ask your friends, and then try it out, and then give it a chance to try. I do recommend using a novel protein approach. In other words, know what protein you're feeding and stick to that one. Foods that have more than one protein, like chicken and beef, you never know which dog it may be responding badly to, whether it's the beef or the chicken. If you stick to one, it's much easier to know, and then if you have to change, you can change that one element in the equation, and it makes it easier a way of making a decision. I do want to bring up some information on screen about probiotics, and I'd love for you to touch on those and just explain what probiotics are if somebody has not heard of them before. Well, probiotics are usually, we've heard of some of them like uh, acidophilus and lactobacillus, and there's also one called econococcus. They're the good bacterial flora. That's what you want in there. You want it, and, and sometimes they're needed. Uh, most dogs do not need it. A healthy dog that's thriving does not need to have that added. And if you do it on a regular basis, it's mostly because of you. Some dogs may like the palatability, but if a dog has had an onslaught of medications or chronic gut disease, then certain, medica certain probiotics could be you know, really re uh, rewarding in the sense to try to help to balance everything. And certainly a dog that's recovering from an illness or has had medications, that'd be the time to consider using and talk to your veterinarian. There's different options you can use. Typically, you would see probiotics already in the gut or this is something you'd have to administer if you're giving medications? You should see it in the gut, but some of it can be wiped out or put in an unnatural flora by the use of medications. And certainly stress is also indicated for probiotics 
addicts or dogs that compete or are on the road heavily, they could benefit from it. Dogs that have had disease states and have had medications, they could benefit from it. So there's various reasons why we may want to supplement. But the general healthy dog that isn't doing anything special and is doing okay, they probably, probably won't need, need it. it. Yes. And in terms of probiotics, I know we could give it as a supplement, but are there any foods that would have probiotics in it? Well, probiot there's also prebiotics and probiotics. They say fermented foods are, are very good. And certainly in, uh, in humans, uh, uh, acidophilus that's found in yogurt and kefir and even sauerkraut and kimchi. But we have to add the minuses with the positive. How many dogs are going to have bad reactions to kimchi? That's pretty spicy stuff, and most <laughs> dogs aren't going to handle it. Some dogs can't handle dairy. So these are ways that, even though it's a natural way of offering it, they may not be able to handle it that way. But you can get it in capsule form and mix it in with the water or food. So that's other ways of doing it. So most dogs can't handle dairy, and most dogs certainly can't handle kimchi. And I, well, dogs will eat sauerkraut. I don't. I know most people don't <laughs> eat sauerkraut, but you know you can see if they do. But those are natural fermented ways of adding uh, probiotic uh, bacterial cultures. And what's the difference now between probiotics and prebiotics? Prebiotics is a big talk, and you need probiotics for prebiotics to work. Most dogs don't need it, uh, and they come in those forms. Uh, some foods already have that included, so I don't think we have to go that route as well. And I want to bring up the probiotics just so people can take a look at this information on screen, or prebiotics, excuse me. So when, when would you have to give these? Well, again, uh, if a dog is having some issues with uh, gut quality, flatulence, uh, we mentioned garlic, but we have to be very careful of that garlic can be toxic to dogs, cause uh, uh, aplastic anemia. So we never really recommend garlic in any large amount, and onions, because they can have toxic effects. So we have to be very careful with what we add. It doesn't cause harm. And so in my recommendation, I would probably steer away from that. Mm -hmm. Foods that have that or supplements? Uh, anything with, with garlic or onions, I would steer away from. And most dogs probably don't need prebiotics. Some foods already have it in it. I think probiotics are indicated if a dog has been stressed or if possibly the gut has been insulted either because of disease or medications to treat disease. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up our next question. Alicia says, what percentage of protein do you recommend for a 14-week-old puppy? Is there a food brand that you would recommend over others? I think that depends. No, that's one of the most controversial questions, and I don't recommend a food because every food may have pluses and minuses. I think she didn't mention the breed, and I think that's very important. If you're dealing with a 14-week-old Shih Tzu, versus a 14-week-old Irish Wolfhound, the differences in the quality and the calories taken are tremendous. Um, I think in the 20-some percent protein range, I'm not an expert in nutritionist, mm -hmm. but in that general ballpark, you want to not overdo it, but want to make sure they're consistently fed proper diet. So the breed, the exercise level, the time frame, all those things are important, and the balance. It's not just protein, but it's the ratio of protein to carbohydrate to other ingredients in the diet that are important. And again, that's a great time to look uh, at your responsible breeder because they may have information that you know, their dogs have thrived. And they may have inside information on certain diets that certain breeds are, should not get. So really with food, a lot of it is trial and error, but if you're getting from a responsible breeder, they've already done the work for you and, and they know what works for the genetics of that line. And a responsible brand, a brand that has had a, a good amount of research. The larger brands have nutritionists on call all the time doing studies. And though people always want to go for the exotic, you know, boutique, it, you know, that sounds good. Uh, but, but it might not work for your it dog. It might not work for your dog. It might be more work. And we may find some issues further down the line that five years from now is, oops, we should have not have done that. So uh, the tried and true ones can sometimes be beneficial. And your vet can really help you when you're talking about individual dog needs. I think it'll give you all sides of the equation. I think it's up to you to finally determine and see how your dog reacts to it. And I think I'm always happy with a dog that when it comes in, it's in good weight, not too fat, not too thin, has normal stools and looks healthy and bright and they're doing well. To me, that's a sign of good health. Taking our next question, Amy says, we recently started feeding new pro to encourage picky pointers to eat their food. Is this a good addition to further encourage good gut health over even a premium sporting breed food like Blue Buffalo with 30% protein and 20% fat? I guess that goes more off of that, you it know, does. particular dog. Yeah, and again, depends on the food. I mean, whatever's palatable. I mean, you know, whatever you do to get your dog to eat. Uh, and some people have used 
uh, probiotics because of the palatability, you know, it tastes more like chicken or what have you, or other kind of conditions. If your dog is thriving and doing well, and the, the level of protein, and the weight seems consistent, what we don't want is an overweight puppy. We want one that is lean but still muscular, and the same thing with an adult. We're trying to steer away from too thin and too heavy. And so if you can find that nice balance where it's growing properly, then I think I have no problems with that. And Dr. Klein, we've talked a little bit about the different breeds and, and how leaky gut can affect all of them. In your experience as a vet, have you seen certain breeds have more issues than others with I, gut health? I think there's been some studies on breeds like Great Danes and Collies and German Shepherds that they've had incidents of, of conditions. And those conditions can vary from bloat to gastrointestinal disease. And we also know certain breeds like miniature schnauzers can have chronic histories of pancreatitis. Now, if that's related to bad gut health, it's, it's up to question, but certainly they're treated with certain ways, and those are the ones that are most interesting to study. But even though your dog might not be on this list that's on your screen, you could still have a gut problem, and that's why it's so important, I think, to watch your specific dog. It could entail any mixed breed dog. I mean, it, it, any kind of reaction and any kind of, you know, it, our gut microbiome is also related to the air that we breathe, the pollution that we are in, you know, entitled to. Everything forms our gut microbiome. So we are uh, basically up to our environment, what we eat, what we breathe, what we see, stress levels, everything else will help determine it. I wanna take our next question. Linda says, my Leo, a Boston Terrier, hardly chews his food. Can I change that or does it matter? He is five years old and six pounds overweight. Well, the six pounds overweight is a little bit of a concern. Uh, that the fact that he eats without chewing, there are bowls that are made to kind of like refrain from, from eating it all at once. You can mash his food up. You can do various things to try to, or feed him smaller amounts at a time. Uh, I think the, the ideal way is to try to figure out with your veterinarian, uh, weight reducing uh, protocol because six pounds is quite a bit on a Boston Terrier and you may not be able to do that all in one year but maybe the goal would be to lose three pounds in one year and three pounds in the next year increase the activity modify his diet and then hopefully together you can kind of come up with some solution when a dog scarfs down their food like that I mean do you worry about choking concerns as well well, I think it, the food will eventually get digested, the, how much do they savor it, you know, and uh, I think that every dog eats differently, uh, but it's not necessarily healthy because they can swallow a lot of air along with that. So they can have elevated food dishes, and again, they have these concentric dishes where they have to slowly work to get to their food, and that might just give them a little extra time. And I think I know people, they've said that if you're blindfolded, you'll eat as much as you can, but once you, and then you stop when you feel full. But if you can actually see it, you keep eating until it's done. So sometimes, just because they are that kind of a dog, maybe don't give them all that at once. You know, space it out a little bit. You know, use your common sense. And if he's eating all that, just give him a third of it, wait 20 minutes, offer him a little bit longer, and, and go from there. Maybe his gut will start to fill up because there's sensors in the gut that tells us satiety points that we're full. But, you know, our eyes are bigger than our gut sometimes. And we and know so that dogs. dogs don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know that and we still do yeah. it. And dogs don't know it, but they do it. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm gonna take our next question. Elaine says, "Is if it is properly balanced nutritionally, is raw okay? Raw can be great if it's done right. Uh, and I think there's so many people have done it and they do it right, and many people do it wrong. It's a lot of work, it's not for everyone. You have to make sure you're feeding a properly balanced diet, that you handle it properly, you sanitize it properly, you discard it properly, you disinfect properly. Uh, you need to talk to a veterinarian that's familiar with it. Not all vets are. A veterinary nutritionalist, not all vets are. And if you commit to it and you do it properly, oftentimes that's good. We do know uh, there have been recalls on certain raw diets, uh, just like with everything else. So we have to be very careful of that and be cognizant of that. I'm not one to either offer it or to say no to it, but we realize that, that it has its complications and its limitations, but it certainly has many advocates. And we know it's a little bit more time consuming to do this type of diet. Much more. Would it, we see it as more expensive as well? Uh, it depends on the person and how much they're willing to go for it. It, it is a commitment mm -hmm. and you have to decide to do it and do it properly all the time. And to take shortcuts, it's, then that's raw diet is not for you. If you were to go onto a raw diet and switch back to regular dog food, is there an issue? Would you have to do a slow transition? Uh, it depends on the dog. Uh, 
quick transitions on any case can cause GI upset. So you have to look at the dog itself and you have to have good reasons to switch. I do want to talk about where people can get a little bit more information because we have a new service, AKC Vet Line. So can you tell us a bit about that? Well, it's an exciting new service still in its pilot stages, but hopefully will be formed over the next month. It's basically going to serve as a concierge, so to mm -hmm. speak, a, a way of a, a, a hearing service where if people have questions, especially first time dog owners, where they can go to to ask questions about general health or nutrition or to see if this is something that requires a veterinarian's care. It's maybe the first line of, of, of questioning. Not everyone has easy access to a veterinarian, which ideally should be the first place you go. But this is a service that people can call and ask certain questions that they may have. They can't uh, easily answer. And we're connected to experts in the field that can guide you to see if the next step would be to call your veterinarian or if it's something you can handle at home. And we do want to bring up that slide so everyone can see a little bit more about AKC VetLine. So this is a fee that you're going to pay. And as Dr. Klein explained, this is live 24 seven care. So you're going to have access to that vet. Maybe you're too far away to drive to a vet. Maybe the vet is either whether they're too far or too expensive. This is something that you pay that fee and they're available for you at any time that you need them. I think this is a great first step, Dr. Klein. It is and you know, for the life of the dog. And sometimes, especially the first time dog owners, the dog will start screaming because he's limping and they're like kids and in five minutes it'll be gone but you freak out or a dog can eat a, a grape or a raisin which may not seem like a lot but if you call you'll find out that is a reason to concern so it'll help it'll it'll be just that extra person there to hear and sometimes it's nice to have someone on your side a little bit of reassurance there yeah. if you have a question or right. concern all right, and if anybody else has any more questions, I know we've touched really, really pretty briefly, but this is a really in-depth topic, gut health. There's so much study being done. National Institute of Health has a national gut pro service uh, program with, for humans, and they're entailing uh, canine research as well. So much is being learned, so much is being researched, and hopefully we'll have more information over the next couple of years. It really is such an interesting topic, and I know for more information too, we can head over to AKC Canine Health Foundation. Yeah, tons of studies being done there. They're very much up on it, and it's a really interesting, important topic. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Klein. Learned thank a lot you. today, appreciate it. <laughs> That's all for today. I'm Marissa Sarmack. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your questions. Next week on Ask the Expert, we'll have AKC TV dog trainer and Family Dog Magazine contributor Kathy Santo on the show. She's going to have all the ways to improve your dog walks. So bring any and all of those training questions to the discussion. Facebook.com slash American Kennel Club. If you ask it, we will answer it. Catch us Tuesday and Friday for an all new AKC Dog Center at noon Eastern Standard Time. We are bringing you the latest dog news from the American Kennel Club. Plus each weekday, we release a new Breed of the Day video. That's nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Today's Breed of the Day is the Curly Coated Retriever. So do not miss it, very exciting. On Thursday at noon, catch an all new episode of AKC's Training Tips. We'll show you the easiest way to teach your dog how to sit. Be sure to download AKC TV on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. You can also download our app on Google Play and iOS. Of course, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and keep those questions coming. AKC TV, sit, stay, watch.